say one thing about our family space for the people in the state which guests. Um, right now, Ed, over the years, has established himself as a southern author, multidisciplinary artist, and collaborator, not only within black studies, but beyond the prosecutors. Professor Lovett's work dedicated to the studies, jazz studies, athletics, philosophy, and literature. Currently, he is a professor of the studies and comparative literature at the <laughs> university. He's interested in social movement, aesthetic experiment, and this of course is a very holistic view of a very important uh, theoretical practical and artistic work that I hope you can do this As someone currently immersed in black study and poetry, not only to the importance of improvisation, both in its general creative technique, but also in its more musical definition. Moreover, he demonstrates that improvisation is a process of time
maybe we'll talk for about an hour and then do about half an hour of Q&A. Does that sound OK? I wanted to begin with this term that you've made popular in black studies. It uh, comes from Immanuel Kant, condition of possibility, this phrase. And I want to make three quick points and then turn it into a question. And then we'll go from there. Uh, first thing is um, our immediate condition of possibility is that we are on the ancestral and tribal lands of the Congaree. And so we should acknowledge that. Uh, the second condition of possibility I'd like to note is that we're in a building named after a, an African-American dance popularized in the 1930s called the Big Apple, uh, which according to Wikipedia was based on the ring shout. <laughs> and the Big Apple as a dance um, reminds, puts me into mind of one of a phrase that I remember from one of your poems. You found dances waiting for dancers. Your silhouette is patient form. And so another phrase of yours, black insurgent sociality, is our condition of possibility for being here and sitting here and speaking together. And then the third thing I wanted to note, and this is our question, one thing I really love about black studies and my commitment to it and my life in it is based on the idea that we understand our, I call it like a symbolic filial piety, but a sense of intellectual genealogy. So if you've known me for more than 15 seconds, you know who David is and Abdul is. And they already know who you are, usually. Uh, but because of the pandemic, you and I haven't had a chance to hang out since the 2019 passing of Dr. Martin Luther Kilson, your undergraduate mentor, among many other distinctions in his decades of service um, in the government department at Harvard. He was the first black person to receive tenure at Harvard. So I'd love to hear you begin by talking about Dr. Kilson and just your conditions of possibility. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks, so And um, and thank you, Alana. That was. I feel like um, <laughs> the two best introductions I've ever had have been here. I think I might just have to stay <laughs> down here. And, um, so um, I appreciate being so warmly welcomed by everybody. Um, man, so Dr. Martin Luther Kilson um, was, my, was my teacher. He was, I, took, I first took a class from him my, the fall semester of my freshman year at Harvard in 1980. And I took a class from him every other semester that I could. Um, actually, and, and I don't quite know what this means or how it happened, but through the accident, through a set of accidents that have to do with my particular upbringing and schooling, he was the first black teacher that I ever had. Um, and, uh, and he just made a, a tremendous impression on me and on my, not just me, but also my, my friend, um, you know, really my best friend from, from college, Stephen O'Harney. Um, and, and so when we wrote our first book together, The Undercommons, we dedicated it to Professor Kilson. Um, and we, we always kept in touch with him. He um, was just a major presence in our lives. He, he modeled for us what it, not only what it was like, well, in a way, I would say he modeled for us what it, was, what it should be, what it could be to be uh, an intellectual in the university, you know, a certain kind of ethics and practice of, of reading and, 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 and writing and, and, and being committed to the idea that the work that you were doing as a scholar was supposed to have something to do with the world um, and with improving the world. But he also, more than that, kind of was an ethics of what it meant to be a, a teacher. So we would just go to his office and just hang out. You know, he had, he had a kind of office in this hall called Coolidge Hall. And he had his own little private office, but he had this big table. He would, 
he would, he would just be sitting there, usually a whole, most of his write, he published lots of books and lots of scholarly articles. Most of his writing was letters to the editor of newspapers. Anything that bothered him, and he had a, one of those old Underwood typewriters, and he would just be pop, 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 you know. And he would, and he made copies of everything. He he would he made copies of articles that he thought we should read. You always left his office with a bundle of stuff to read. You left his class with a bundle of extra things to read because he would just he, he there was this place called Nomen Copy. He would come into his office every into our classroom with a with a this blue double-breasted blazer that was must have been 35 years old that had long since become too small, <laughs> but somehow he managed to squeeze himself into it every day, you know, wearing a cowboy hat that he got from Wyoming, you know, and smoking his pipe and and he. He, he was here, Moten. Uh, you, you read, here's something to read, Moten. Uh, Harney, you read this. Hi, guys. You know, he would talk like that. We walk in there. A lot of times, strategically, we would go to Coolidge about 4:30, because we knew if we stayed there till 5:30, he would take us home for dinner. <laughs> and um, his first book was called uh, "Political Change in a in a West African State." It was on the sort of newly decolonized Sierra Leone. He did a lot of work in Ghana. He used to, he would say, oh yeah, come for dinner, guys. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make a Ghanaian dish, you know? And uh, I'll never forget it. So we were driving around with him and he stopped at Kentucky Fried Chicken, had, came out with a bucket of chicken. <laughs> He's like, oh, it's gonna be good, you know? And, um, and what I realized, I didn't even realize it until, you, Years later, like a few years ago, he would make this kind of jollof rice, right? It was a Ghanaian dish. It was just with Kentucky Fried Chicken in it, you know? And um, it was, he just, it was, to talk with him in class was like, the books would become alive. He taught politics in, in Africa, but also black politics in the United States. So I'll never forget, there was a, a famous book called uh, American Negro Politics, written, I think, by a scholar named Harold F. Gosnell from like 1940-something. It, it, was, it was primarily an, anal an analysis of the first black congressman from Illinois, William Dawson. And Kilson, <laughs> we'd be, he'd be talking about the book, but he would do this thing where he would start telling you about the person who wrote the book. And he had seen them, you know. Harold Foote Gosnell, a mousy little man, you know? And by the time you would, you would just get, the people he wrote about, the people he talked about, they, they became alive for us, you know? So, so yeah, I, 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 I know that if, there are other people who are also conditions of possibility for me, it's like more than I can count. But certainly, without him, I never would have gone to, 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 I don't think I would have gone to grad school. I don't even think I would have graduated from college, frankly. Um, this is another story. I don't know if I should tell it, but I, I, um, this was, so at Harvard, there's like about a three week period between the end of exams and when you graduate and you sort of stay on campus for, and I had, when I went to college, I was so involved in, you know, I played football my freshman year. And I studied with Kilson, and but I started hanging out with these friends who were very politically active, and we would go into the the black working class section of of Boston, and you know, we were tutoring at the Walpole Prison and working with this extraordinary woman named Sarah Small, who ran a thing called the Packard Mance, which was a kind of a, 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 really a kind of settlement house for young black women in Boston, and. And, and of course, Kilson was at the heart of all these things too, but there was a guy named Eugene Rivers, an extraordinarily important figure in you know, sort of contemporary black religious thought and religious practices, and he was like a mentor for us. But, so I was doing all that stuff, but I kind of was forgetting to go to class. Um, <laughs> you know, and, um, and I flunked out. Uh, I took, uh, yeah, I flunked my German because you had to take a 
foreign language first year. So somehow I managed to not remember to, to finish my second semester of German before it was time to graduate. And I got this, not an email, letter, you know, you're not gonna graduate because you still have to do your language requirement. I'm like, man, my mama and them just got the tickets, <laughs> you know, they're coming up here for graduate school. So I went to see Kilson, you know, who else was I gonna go to? And I'll never forget it. Cause I think he was kind of disgusted. Like, how come you, how could you mess that up? How could you not take care of that, you know? And, um, but then he looked at me and he said, what well, Moten, you're, you're not a sucker Moten. You're not, you're, you're not, you're not, you know, he's basically saying it's worth it for me to do this last thing I'm gonna do for you. And so he called his friend who was the Dean of Students who's a black man from, from uh, Alabama named Archie Epps. Some of you might know his name just because when Malcolm X did those famous sort of speeches at Harvard, Archie Epps edited the collection of Malcolm X's speeches at Harvard from 1963, I think. And he called the dean of students and said, Archie, uh, I got this you know, kid here. And basically, I, went, I had to go to the dean's office and, and get talked about for a few minutes by Archie Epps, but they set me, but they let me, and it made me, and the first thing I did when I got to graduate school was I took all this German, you know, <laughs> and um, I, I got to the point where I could read pretty, I, I wanted to, it did, I didn't have to do it, but I just wanted to do it so I could tell them it, it wasn't because I was just a slacker, you know, I, I just got caught up in something. So, um, Anyway, he, he did, he, I'm sorry I'm going on so long, but he, he, uh, he was a great, 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 great scholar. He was, he was Cornell West's teacher, you know, which is why like Stefano and I, we like to think of ourselves as Cornell's little cousins, you know, we, we were part of that family, part of that line. And you know, um, Professor Kilson was, he was a descendant of a, he knew Du Bois, you know, he, he worked with Du Bois, he, he, he knew Nkrumah, you know, he, yeah, I mean, he, you know, when Einstein came to Lincoln, he was there, you know, so, because he went to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. So. Anyway, um, he was a great person, and he, he passed away in 2019, and, and he was in, the, he had written this, multi-volume history of African-American intellectuals, which is still eventually gonna come out. His widow, who's also a great scholar herself, Marion Kilson, she is editing that work. But he also wrote a memoir, and, and Stefano and I were able to, to help get the memoir published um, last year by Duke University Press, and we wrote a, a afterward for it. And um, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a great, great, great person. Yeah, I'll never forget, somebody posted a clip of Cornell saying he had to change his schedule around to hear Fred speak <laughs> recently. Speaking of little cousins. Uh, why don't we talk about, on our way to talking about this splendid truncation black study that Alana already evoked, why don't we talk about where you stand on the, and, and how you see the formation of black studies. So. Black studies is a dehiscence at the heart of the institution and on its edge. Well, there's a way in which I think it's important to see that, that, that black studies is, is an extraordinary achievement um, as, a, as an intellectual discipline and in all of the different iterations of it not only in, 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 in universities, but, but especially, you know, the, 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 the different kinds of obstacles that black studies had to face in order to, to, to have a place in the university um, are very different as one goes from institution to institution. But, but each institution has its own story of origins and, and those stories are almost always the stories of heroic actions. And those heroic actions are often the actions that are, are, are taken up by people who 
don't, at least on the, on the most direct level, benefit from the institutionalization of black studies. Black studies is, a, is, a, is, an, is an eruption into the university um, from uh, modes of intellectual activity that the university has, in general, been designed to, to exclude. And, and, and when the university does include those forms of intellectual activity, it's usually in order to regulate those forms of intellectual activity. And that's the other side of this, is that there's a, there's a kind of triumphant story that we tell about how black studies operates at a university like this or at you know, Yale or you know, Bethune-Cookman or you know, any number of places. But, but that's, that story also is always shadowed by the ways that, that black thinking and that the social force and the social sort of animus, you know, and, 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 and of black thinking is, is in some sense placed in danger when it enters into the university space. That doesn't mean that it shouldn't be here. It just means that it has to be nurtured and, and protected um, not only from, you know, it has to be nurtured and protected even within the framework of, 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 of its having been welcomed. And this, this makes it a, a, a complicated, complicated proposition. Um, a lot of times people talk about what it means to be, you know, about inclusion. Um, and now there's all this talk in the university about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and we know what people mean when they say inclusion, or we know some of what they sometimes mean. And sometimes some of that is really good, you know? But I often wish that we thought about using the, even though it's more unwieldy, that we use the term non-exclusion. Because it's kind of like, I don't want to be excluded from this particular set of resources, from this particular set of chances, from this particular set of responsibilities. But I don't want to be included in the already existing form of those things. Right. When I come in, you know, right, as Anna and Julie Cooper says and Paula Giddings echoes, where and when I enter, speaking of black women, it's got to change. Right. It's not enough for you to welcome me into your thing. You have to be open to the fact, to the possibility and the fact that when we get there, it's going to be different. It's got to be different. It can't simply be the same old structure that used to exclude us. Right. And, and this has to be something that you can be open to, and it actually, ideally, it would be something that you would desire. Right? Um, and so I think that's been the, the battle for, 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 for black studies. You know, and that's, that's one fundamental part of the, of the history is, is dealing with the, the seemingly benign, but often very malignant forces of inclusion. And then another part of the problem has been um, that the seemingly benign but often malignant forces of inclusion are often still accompanied by the same old brutal forces of exclusion. You know, so sometimes it's hard to know what and who you are confronting. Um, and I think a lot of interesting work has been done over the last 15 years really thinking about what has historically occurred in the advent of the movement of black studies into the university and in, into you know, predominantly white institutions, especially in you know, Nick Mitchell, who teaches at University of California, Santa Cruz, has written about this. But, he, but I think you know, one of the first people to really write about it well was uh, an old uh, sort of fellow of, of ours, Professor Tolson, no leeway Rooks, um, at, who was a graduate student also at the University of Iowa who teaches, I want to say she's at Brown now, but, but she wrote, you know, very, you know black, black study, white money. <laughs> you know, black studies, white money. What does it mean to be put in a situation in which the resources that are necessary for the task that you do are being, you know, granted and doled out and in some ways restricted and regulated, right, by structures that are, kind of antithetical to, to your 
to your, uh, to your mission, to the mission that you see. So, you know, these are some of the issues that, that, that black studies have faced, you know, over the last 50 years. And, and now they're being, you know, exacerbated and kind of, you know, made even more problematic by the fact that the, the university in general is being defunded. You know, I mean, <clears throat> the old debates between Du Bois and Booker T. Washington about the value of a liberal arts education versus a vocational education were, were really, it, it struck me, you know, years ago, and I, I, I know other people notice this too, that, that those debates about, you know, about what kind of, what should education be, those have now become the prominent debates about education in general. You know, and all the talk about STEM and all the talk about a kind of vocational education, that's, that's now, those are the structures that are now in place for everybody. And, um, and what's interesting and what's important is to note, and what's really problematic is to note that, that this turn towards a sort of vocationalization of education for everyone coincides with the defunding of education for everyone, right? Um, you know, there's a, there's a structure of, of political and economic power which uses the educational system for two primary things, I think. One is to, to distribute money, right? When they say that the university is an economic engine, you know, that's what they mean. Tremendous amounts of capital flow into the university and they are redistributed and usually that redistribution is up, right? It's everyday working people's tax dollars being funneled into the pockets of developers, right? And that's, that's a major part of what the university does. It, it legitimizes that upward distribution of wealth. And the other thing that it does is it legitimizes the class divisions that are structured by that upward division in the first place as an ideological formation. The university is a place where people say that it's defined by meritocracy you know, I mean, we know all the different reasons that come into it, why it is that people can be successful at the kinds of things you have to do to seem successful at a university. And it, it, much of the time it has to do with resources that you've been given. Very seldom does it have anything to do with so-called intelligence or even hard work, right? And we know that. And we all know plenty of smart people who could never be at a place like this for a whole bunch of different reasons. So. The quest, but the university creates a kind of social structure in which those divisions can be justified, right? And we even talk about those justifications within classes, right? That's what grading is for. It's, it's to create, you know, stratifications and, and hierarchies, you know? So, you know, when those things are happening at the same time that the university is being shrunk and defunded, you know, the question that we have to start to ask is, what's gonna happen to the really cool kinds of thinking that we sometimes get to do at a place like this? Where are we gonna go for that now? Because it seems like they're trying to shut, shrink this thing down, you know? So um, where, where are we gonna go to do the kinds of things that it seems like we can only do at a place like this? Um, you know, so, and I think that's, it, you know, um, it's, it's a question for black studies too, but the question for black studies might be a little bit less severe, if only because we sort of already know where we can go to do that kind of work, you know, back to the barbershop, <laughs> you know, <laughs> back to the beauty shop, back to the, you know, uh, to the juke joint, to church, you know. Where, where it was always done, you know, and. Uh, so. so this corporatization of the, of the university and the defunding of education, specifically public education overall, is roughly coterminous with the founding of institutional black studies, specifically the field and prism known as black feminism. And so I'd be curious to hear are you at all surprised by how much good stuff has come out of black studies and black feminism within institutional spaces, given the extreme amounts of institutional duress we've been working under? 
well, <laughs> you know, black folks in general and black women in particular have been proven for about 500 years that it's possible to produce goo gobs of good stuff under duress. You know, that's, you know, so I'm not surprised by how much good work emerges, but I'm always, uh, and I think it's really important to celebrate that good work and to, and to avail ourselves of it. But I'm also angry about when I think about all the good work that could happen if the duress weren't there, right? So, so I think it's important to keep both of those things, you know, in mind. And, um, you know, it, the, the historical emergence of, of black studies and, and also I think women's studies in the university and then, you know, quickly on their heels, you know, um, queer studies, Asian American studies, Latinx studies. The, these were moments in which it struck, it's, I mean, I was talking about this with my wife the last night. Um, the amount of, of social insurgency, um, and, and I also would even say more specifically, kind of, you know, interracial social insurgency in the 20th century. It's like a great, it's become a secret to us that we no longer know. But stuff was always popping off. The, the, you know, when they talk about the red scare of the teens and 20s, it's because they were, it's because bosses were scared, right? They were scared about the fact that people were actively talking about alternative social arrangements that were not predicated on these extraordinarily rigid and vicious class divisions. And those new social arrangements were, you know, economic and, and political social arrangements were always accompanied, always driven in some sense by this ongoing black insurgency that, that goes back to before the end of slavery. So there was, you know, revolt was, was in the air. And, and in a lot of ways, you know, the, 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 the tremendous social insurgency that we associate with the 60s is really stuff that was, the, 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 the engine for it is in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And this is a story, this is the, the secret history of the 20th century, is this history of rebellion. And it was a global rebellion. People were like, and really, it, it keeps going back further, that, that, that illegitimate oligarchical power is always trying to suppress rebellion. Like, I love Shakespeare, and I especially love Shakespeare's history plays. So Henry IV, part two and one, Richard II, Henry V. Those are plays that were written and performed in the late 16th century, but they were about the late 14th, early 15th century. And it's this tremendous anxiety in the late 16th century about social insurgency at that moment. And Shakespeare addresses that by talking about the tremendous anxiety that was also present about social insurgency in the late 14th and early 15th century. There's just this history of revolt, right? And it makes you think of C.L.R. James, the, you know, a history of Pan-African revolt, and that history goes back. It's, it's an almost unbroken history of insurgency. And so, it, it sometimes you could say that it, it comes to a head, you know, in the 1960s. But what ends up happening is that people in universities, people in the government, they began to say, well, this, this level of insurgency is so profound and so powerful, it's impossible to imagine how we would fully suppress it other than by incorporating it, <laughs> right? That that will be the quickest way to regulate it. And, and again, and I think African American studies, black studies in the, US, in, the, in the US Academy emerges at that moment. It's folded into the university so that it can be regulated by the university. It doesn't mean that a whole bunch of great, amazing work doesn't come out of it at, in, the, in the wake of that, but it's work that, but we see this, it's a connection, there's this connection between inclusion and regulation. 
And that becomes another part of this battle that we have to, to fight, you know? So um, I really, it, 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 I think it puts us in, in a complicated position. It's not a, there's no simple thing to denounce. There's no simple thing to disavow, you know? There, there are people who are doing great things in the university and there are people who are maybe not doing such great things. And, and we have to kind of judge it you know, in this careful way and, and, and in a kind of, and with some humility, because a lot of the times the, the problematic things that we might do might not be a function of our own intentions. And you dog somebody else out and you think, well, wait a minute, what, what was I doing here? What did I do? You know, um, and so, you know, but, but I, I believe that, that black studies is, a, is an insurgent intellectual activity and practice, and that that insurgency has to be, it should be maintained. Um, and, and so, you know, this is what, you know, this is what, we, what we're thinking about all the time. So your sense is that in the last 50 years, the conditions are different for our, our institutionalized ability to hear that insurgency, to record it, to be able to get a sense of the general intelligence always being rich rather than poor, or as our old friend James Ford would say, the capacity for the general intelligence to be able to think through crisis in real time, assess it, assess the conditions in real time. Mm -hmm. well, you know, it's funny, it's like, 20 years ago I used to, I used to teach at, uh, to teach at Duke. It's hard for me to say that because, I, 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 anyway, <laughs> I used to teach there. And uh, I, um, it was during the, the, I started teaching in 2007, right at the beginning of the last great sort of economic collapse and crash. And it was, and sometimes I would ride on the shuttle bus. Duke has sort of, a, a, North and South Campus, and sometimes I would ride, and, and I would kind of listen to students talking, and I would hear students saying stuff like, well, my dad told me that if I can graduate in three years instead of four, he would buy me a car. And what I, what I thought I was noticing from these, and, it, and you've got to understand, that there was a moment when privilege became like almost like a slur, you know, check your privilege. My students at Duke, man, they, they never thought, they, were, they didn't shy away from the idea of themselves being privileged. They were completely okay with the idea that they were privileged because they were also completely committed to the idea that they deserved it, right? They deserved their, their privilege, okay? But I think it was an interesting moment to see these particular students begin to have anxiety about their capacity to maintain that privilege, okay? And they were feeling their parents have anxiety about that, okay? And what I noticed was the difference between these students who were, seemed affluent and they were definitely mostly white. And sometimes my black students, I felt that they had this extraordinarily interesting advantage, which they had some stories that they could tell themselves about why it is that they were no longer, that they had no immediate access to privilege. That, that we, had, we had, and black studies was a, a place to, to learn those stories and to refine those stories. Like, like we know why stuff ain't working out for us. We know the history of that. Um, and it struck me that some of these students that I'm talking about, you know, they didn't have a story. They just, but they had a real inkling that things weren't gonna be good. They knew, like we talk about, you know, CLR James, obviously, <coughs> excuse me, but he, he loves Thomas Jefferson. He, he loved the fact that for him, Thomas Jefferson's intervention in political theory was absolutely crucial. He says there was no theory of politics before Thomas Jefferson that asserted right, the people's right to pursue happiness. It's like, that's an extraordinarily new phenomenon in the history of political theory. For, for James, who's this great, great political theorist and activist from Trinidad who 
you know, lived late in the, in the, into the 20th century. My students had given up the pursuit of happiness, right? These were students, they were like, they, they, on the one hand, they knew that as Duke students, they would have the privilege to maybe have easier access into investment banking, right? But at the same time, they had completely lost any faith in the possibility of being happy being an investment banker, right? For them, it was a scramble to maintain what it is that their parents were giving them in the face of their parents literally making deals with them about how we can give you a little bit less because we're strapped. And, and what got me is they didn't have any kind of story about why that was. They didn't have any stories about it. Their stories were always about ascendancy and opportunity. Their what they had was a discourse to tell you to stop complaining about your story, right? Like my partner, Laura Harris, she was teaching James because she's writing a book about James. And you know, James had this idea that there should be universities on every corner, right? Basically, that, 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 that high level public education should be so ubiquitous that you can't walk two blocks without having access to it. And they would say stuff like, oh, he's just naive. You know, he's this 82 year old man living in London who, you know, the great thinkers of his day were coming to sit in his bedroom just to be around him for a couple of hours. And they had, you know, oh, he's naive. Right? It's like, no, he's not naive. You don't have any sort of story about how stuff could be different. You have no, you don't have any access to the idea of an alternative. Right? So, so one question is, how do we you know, generate and disseminate the history as well as the history of the continuing possibility of the alternative. And universities have been places where that could happen. And they, they have all, they've been. But meanwhile, the people who run stuff, I think they've sort of decided over the last 50 years under, the, under what they would conceive of as the duress of constant rebellion that came to a head in the 1960s, they were like, well, if the university is a place where we can, where the alternative, where the idea that life could be different and better than this for everybody, if the university is a place where that idea is being disseminated, then we need to shut that down. We need to tell people, we need to tell kids that they should study more math and engineering, right? And, 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 and not have time for classes that talk about that stuff until we can figure out a way to get them on the track to replicate the already existing order of things without having to go to the university. Okay. So we, we're going we gonna to squeeze this. I mean, I, it feels to me like that there have been clear indications in policy that this is what this is what educational policy has been doing over the last certainly over the last 50 years, maybe longer than that. One of the great important innovations of black insurgency immediately after the Civil War was the development of public education in the South. That was an invention of people who five years earlier had been enslaved. And it strikes me that in the South, that, that there's been a kind of rearguard action against the idea of public education ever since then. And it's coming to a kind of head now, you know? And um, so it feels like something that we have to really think about and try to get ready to fight, you know, about. And does that fight occur within our undercommons relationship to the institution? Does it occur through the fugitive planning that you discuss in that book with Stefano? Well, I mean, I think it comes into play at the level of these questions about, do I want to be included in an already existing structure? Or do I want to, you know, do we want to, to work through the mechanisms of non-exclusion to, to change and, and, and radically disrupt the, the already existing structure? So, you know, 
many of the great figures in our intellectual tradition, in, in sort of Afro-diasporic intellectual tradition, went to traditional universities and, and, and did graduate work. But, but many more of them didn't, <laughs> you know? You know, our, I believe a, a, a good argument can be made that the greatest, if let's say the greatest sociologist of the 20th century and also have to, the greatest black sociologist of the 20th century is W.B. Du Bois. The second greatest is Richard Pryor. Um, <laughs> Now, what does it mean? It, you know, Du Bois's work is extraordinary, um, in, inimitable, and it ranges over every possible academic discipline. It seems to me that Richard Pryor's does too. It's a fundamentally different discourse. It, op it operates in different places, and, he, and it came from dis different places. If he's a great sociologist, then part of what that means is is that there, are pool, there were pool halls in the 1940s in, in Peoria, Illinois, that were places of study. And he talks about them as places of study. Um, pool halls, brothels, you know, restaurants, juke joints, you know, after hours clubs. So we know that, 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 that these forms of study are not just that, that study can happen in these other places, but we also know that, those, that the modalities of study took different forms. And that they were, they were, and what it means is, is when you bring those modalities of study into the university, how, what, how, it's, I'm not saying that they should stay unchanged, but I am saying some elements of those modes of study have to be preserved. And you don't accept the legitimacy of all of the protocols of the university in order to enter into it. You, you can't, you know? So I kind of feel like, I don't know if black study, I know that black study is absolutely bound up with and compatible with and is constantly produced in reading and writing. But I don't know that black study is, 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 is compatible with the reading and writing of term papers. Or, or the giving of exams. That I don't know, right? But we organize intellectual protocols in the university around evaluation. And the evaluation corresponds to stratification. So if we could detach evaluation and stratification, right, from, from intellectual activity, what, what does that open up for us? You know, and when you've got, you know, when you've got when you're operating within an intellectual tradition, which is constantly producing a critique of evaluation and stratification, what does it mean to then impose evaluation and stratification on that tradition? That's a contradiction. So that's something that we would have to then think about. We, you know, why are we giving people grades? Why are we, why do we organize ourselves around this, the specific, you know, time? that the university imposes, you know? Um, is that stuff really conducive to study? What are you getting ready for when you do it that way? When you submit yourself to those kinds of temporal arrangements and those work arrangements, you know, what are you getting ready for? What are you being prepared for? Um, but what do you say to the student who would say back that the desire for both recognition and inclusion are authentic desires to them? that it's part of who they are, part of their socialization. You and I could do the, the pedagogical process of having them unlearn that or try, right? And, and give them stuff to think about on that front. And that we're doing that for ourselves all the time. But it seems to me that, I mean, like, like Judith Butler always says, right? The passionate attachment to power is, right, so. Well, you said the desire for what? For Inc recognition? And inclusion. Well, I would say, well, See, here's where unfortunately one becomes a teacher. And, you know, in trouble with teachers, they always think they know better, you know. Um, so you have to sort of, how you regulate your, your to, to, how, how do I, you know, as a teacher regulate that, that horrible, you know, tendency to, to think that I know better. Try to ask a question, you know, try to put it in the form of a question. 
and be open to the possibility that the answer might not be what you want, but you sort of say, well, what if the terms that we've been given for what we want are imprecise? What if recognition is an imprecise term for what it is and maybe what we really want is friendship, <laughs> right? Um, inclusion is an imprecise term and what, what we really want is to be, is not to be excluded, right? Um, now, if it turns, and what if it turns out that the imprecise names that we've given to our desires have a negative impact on the way we understand and enact and carry out and attempt to achieve those things that we desire. So that would be my first question. Is, like what, is there a better way to describe what it is that we want? You know? um, and I, I think that friendship is a better way to describe what it is that we want than recognition. Um, and, and then you can ask, okay, well, how can we build that? How can we, is there a way that we could do that that's a little bit better than what we've been doing? Because you know? um, what if it turns out that the things that we've been doing have been structured in order to get us recognition? And it turns out recognition ain't all it's cracked up to be. You know, inclusion is not all it's cracked up to be. So maybe, maybe we mischaracterize what we want right, in a way that deviates, get, that has created a situation in which it, 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 it gives us, it detours us around what we want. So, so let's think a little bit more about what we want and see if we can name it a little bit more clearly, a little bit more sharply, and then see what we can see, try to get at it again. In the opening paragraph of Souls of Black Folk and the strange meaning of being black that you're writing on, before he introduces the definition of double consciousness even, Du Bois is talking about that moment of being rejected as a little boy, trying to give that card to the white girl, right? Is that a desire for recognition is it a, or is it a desire for friendship, right? It's, it's certainly a moment of dereliction that inaugurates everything in, you know, in, in, our, in our tradition. Well, I'm trying to, see that's one in where <coughs> I'm trying to take my own advice and pause before I answer because <laughs> this phrase in my, Mom and my grandma always used to say it's just running through my head, rampantly through my head. So I'm just going to say it because if I don't say it, it's, it's not going to get out of my head. But the old people just talk about, my mind told me. <laughs> yeah. My mind is telling me that it was a desire for recognition, for friendship, oh, okay. not recognition. But, oh, it's a totally beautiful and interesting thing. What? It makes you want to go through the entire history of the, the, the custom of giving cards, giving visiting cards or naming cards. What, right? Some of y'all, I tend to want to think of it as a Victorian phenomenon. Like I associate it with Thackeray, you know, with, you know and, and, and in, a, in, a, in a way that, you know, And, and, in, and, in, and, and there's something about that protocol which in a way is a kind of plea for, for recognition. So, so on the one hand, maybe, maybe the mechanism, maybe the protocol that he was engaged in was designed for recognition, but that doesn't mean that the original desire from which it, you know, that out of which the, which, 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 which you know, which produced the protocol was for recognition. It's, it's, I always associate the giving of cards with some, with a kind of semi-desperate attempt to move up a step socially, right? Like leaving your card at, at you know, uh, the Duke of Omnium's house, you know, or something, you know, and, and, 
and, and the card being rejected or thrown away, you know, this is not a person that I could ever receive show socially or something. You know, but then like, why do a card? Why, what is the card meant to indicate? You know, what, what do people do when they read? Well, first of all, oh, well, you're the kind, of, at least you're high enough to produce a card, you know? Like, my tendency would be to want to say, well, I, you know, I kind of want to hang out with people where I don't have to give them a card, right, right. you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I don't know. There's there's a kind of it makes and Du Bois didn't have that. Yeah. Like six year old Du Bois didn't get to have that. Yeah. Well, Great Barrington. Yeah. Who 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 knows? You know where? How does that work? How how does any of that work? Um, there's more to be. What makes me realize I need to go back and and read that big Levering Lewis biography again because maybe he's got something in there about that. What? Where did this practice of giving, call, you know, um, what, what does that already mean? So, you know. So Steven Yeun, the actor, beautiful boy, last year said when he was promoting Minari, right, this breakthrough Korean American film, sometimes I wonder if being Asian American is when you're thinking about everyone else, but nobody's thinking about you, <laughs> right? As a kind of Du Boisian formulation, based on this notion of dereliction, based on this notion of, of contending with your desire for recognition from the outset, right? Dealing with the management of that in an anti-black world in a xenophobic condition. And so what, as I'm thinking about, you know, what Asian American racialization, how it riffs off of the anti-black conditions, right? That Du Bois is talking about, it raises these questions of what it would mean to kind of totally subsume or totally suspend that desire for that maybe even forms of friendship in the bad world. It's like, see this is one of those <coughs> questions where You start to try to answer it, and it's such a struggle, it's such a grapple, you know, a battle intellectually, even to, to frame the question and then to try to address it. And you try, you begin to try in my head, and I'm like, I, I want there to be a different question. <laughs> uh, you know. Why? Okay. Because sometimes I think we, we, we like, we imagine that the human social life is on the most basic level at its most sort of fundamental moment before any further elaboration. It's some sort of relation between one subject and another. And then immediately, all kinds of complications ensue. Because it's not really about a relation between one subject and another. It's about a relation between one subject who sees that other as an object. And that's already a problem. You know, and, and one of the great desires of every human subject is to not be treated like an object. It's already a trouble. And of course, the resistance to being objectified meets its own resistance on the part of the subject who is coming to grips with the fact that they can't ever really feel like a subject unless this object exceeds to being their object. Mm -hmm. I can't be who I am unless I meet you there as a kind of mechanism which allows me to see who it is that I am. Right? I love like every now and he is sold from one ship captain to another ship captain. The ship captain buys him. First thing he says to every other one is, Do you know who I am? Which is ridiculous, right? Man, how would I know who you I've never seen you. Who are you? Do you know my structural position? 
I'm your master. Well, why would you need to ask me that? Well, you need me to tell you who you are. So, can you establish yourself without that question? So, now, what, what does that mean? If, 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 the, if the determination of the subject is predicated on the ability to manipulate and control an object, well, race makes it really, gives us a whole series of social of, of, of social conditions that make it easier to do that, that manipulation of regulation. Right? It, it, it becomes, and it's almost as if you say, well, you know, to conceive of someone as an object, even if, even if, there is no regime. In other words, there, it makes me want to say something extreme, which I believe to be true. All of a sudden, folks might say something to eat, but I would say the racialization and gendering of the object in human sociality is already given at the moment in which you say to, as an individual, you see of the other as an object. The racialization is already in place. The gender is already in place. So, what I'm trying to say is, what do we want from sociality? Okay. Is already taken from us by way of the particular ways that we think about how sociality and its most basic operates as a relation between the subject. That if that's the modality through which, through which sociality operates, we are already in trouble. We are already fighting the music battle. We are already, we're, we are already our, our social relations are determined and defined by a lack that we can't compensate for. Right. And there's a massive body of intellectual work which comes to try to understand that. And it's called psychoanalysis. <laughs> <laughs>
questions? New questions? It's, um, well, this goes, this is a, so, um, it's actually connected to some of the questions about the origins of black studies, believe it or not. Um, so when I was in my freshman year, I would say Noam Chomsky was like the essential part of my curriculum. <laughs> You know, although none of it was ever assigned in class, you know, which is part of my trouble. But, but Chomsky was also a real physical, you know, active presence, you know, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, because he taught at MIT. So you could hear him speak. He would speak a lot at the first church, Congregational Church in Cambridge, because, and this was during the height of, you know, uh, you know, Americans, American intervention in Central America was already very much underway. We often want to associate that with Reagan, but it was a Carter operation in Nicaragua and El Salvador. And, and that was at the, you know, Noam, Noam Chomsky's political critique was, was, very, was always directed towards U.S. intervention, and particularly U.S. intervention in, in, in Latin America. And the books that he w was producing at that moment, particularly with the, the books he co-wrote with this other, uh, with a collaborator of his named Edward Herman, there was a two volume study called The Political Economy of Human Rights, which was absolutely a, a, a critique of, 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 of the Jimmy Carter foreign policy, which I know y'all don't remember, but I remember that it was predicated on, on the advancing of human rights. Okay. And Chomsky just was pillaring it, and, and here's why. So I remember reading some of this stuff where Chomsky was like, look, in the 19, early 1970s, the, the, the Trilateral Commission, which was a kind of huge globalized think tank of Western and then eventually Japanese leaders who were trying to organize some new, basically the, the origins of what 25 years later, we would begin to call globalization, right? They commissioned a study that was written by Kilson's colleague in the Harvard government department, Samuel Huntington, who eventually was made more infamous by a book he wrote called The Clash of Civilizations. But the book that he and some others co-authored, and it was, I think, published in 1975, is called The Crisis of Democracy. It was a direct response to, to student and worker insurgency in the 60s. And the crisis of democracy, as they outlined it, was essentially that there was too much democracy. That there's all these people in the, in the world, students, um, you know, workers, union organizers, women, racial minorities, who for some reason started to come, come get the temerity that have the, they started to come up with this notion that they should have some way, say in the decisions that went into the organizing of their lives, right? And, and, and reading Chomsky say that, it immediately for me, it dovetailed with my own experience. It dovetailed with my experience of watching my mom and the political act, act, activism that she was engaged in. And I was like, this is somebody who understands what's, what's going on. You know, and Chomsky had all these ties to, to, to obviously to the anti-war movement in the United States in the 60s, to the Black Panthers. He, he, you know, he supported Fred Hampton, you know. He, he did, you know he, so, for, so for me, Chomsky was absolutely crucial as a, as a, as a, as a, as a political analyst, and, and his political analysis was based, eventually I came to understand, 
on, you know, the sort of tenets and ideas of anarchism, and it was fundamental to my own, you know, uh, sort of political formation. But it was not separate from the linguistics, because, because you know, Chomsky was a, a humanist and a universalist. His, idea, the, his belief that everyone should have something to say was all bound up with the fact that he thought that every human being, as a function of their biological endowment, should be treated a certain way. And that any violation of that treatment, right, was, was a violation of, 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 of fundamental moral and ethical, you know, truths. And his belief in human universality was, I think, very much bound up with his belief and his theories of a universal grammar. He thought that there was, Chomsky was committed to the idea that there was this amazing thing that human beings could do, which is that they could utter a sentence that, could, that had never been said before in human history and will never be said again, right? And, and what Chomsky believes still, because he's still working, he's like 94 years old, he's still working, you can see him on YouTube, I mean, he's on YouTube giving talks about Ukraine, you know? <laughs> He's so old, he whispers now almost, but he's still working. But he believed that this ability to create new sentences, what he called the creative aspects of language use, could not be explained by experience, right? That children are not made, don't have access to enough experience to explain this capacity they have to generate new sentences, right? He, he calls it, he called it the poverty of stimulus. There simply isn't enough stimulus, right? So, so, so this amazing ability we have, it must be something that we're born with. And if you're born with that, I, I mean, I'm saying this in ways that he probably wouldn't put it, but if you're born with that, that means you're supposed to also have a whole bunch of other resources that are allow you to cultivate that. Food, shelter, clothing, freedom from abuse, freedom from tyranny, right, right? So his belief, his political beliefs were predicated, I think, on, the, on, a, on, a, on, on about as genuine an idea of human universality as it's possible to produce, <laughs> right? You know, I, I don't know that there's a perfect notion of human universality that can stand up, right? But his was the most genuine and the most perfect that I have ever, much more. But his universality makes Kant's universality seem like, well, like, like the, the racist lie that it is, okay? But, you know, um, so, so yeah, he was really, and remains, you know, for me. I, uh, and even, look, man, to the extent that I have, like, the temerity to disagree with Chomsky about something, which is ridiculous, right, okay? But even my disagreements with him only exist as a function of reading him. Like, I can't organize my thoughts to disagree with him without him, you know? So, so, so he was very important for me and, and, and my crazy little nerdy friends, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Another question? You guys, uh, in your opinion, why do you think the movement has been to suppress his story as opposed to his story? Well, well can, you, can, you, can you elaborate on the distinction? I'll be honest with you, sir. Thank you very much. I figured you would, and I'm waiting. <laughs> Throughout history, it has been movements even now to suppress, to let people not know and learn the truth about what happened, and also how African Americans, along with others, who have made conscious movements despite the odds against to make this country the way it is now for growth, for invention, creativity, knowledge, ability, 
not only here, but over to other planets as well. Because of our subconscious, there was had an opportunity to gravitate to consciousness in the eye, in where God was written, of all races, but still have love joined in together as one. But yet, that truth has constantly been suppressed down. I have seen it because of fear. I wonder, do you see that same truth? If so, then what is the best way is people here who wants to make a change, but yet they may be fearful to make a move to participate. Mm -hmm. So what, in your opinion, is a way that can unite together without the fear, but yet because it's the right thing to do, knowing that there are people who have no fear, mm -hmm. who have no problem whatsoever mm -hmm. in working together as one, because we know how universal laws work and how universal law work in it, gravitation of good or evil. You cannot stop doing it. Law of physics, causes such a negative, but evil of positive. Okay, that's what the negative might say, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how can people who want to participate, participate in making the movement happen? I mean, well, the fear <coughs> factor, as it were, excuse me, I'm almost over this cough, and uh, I, I always feel like I gotta make sure everybody knows it, it ain't that cough, it's, it's another <laughs> cough, but, but, uh, but um, what, if, what if we say not only fear, because fear is, fear is an interesting word, right, because it, it implies that people are, are scared maybe of a new way, scared of another story, scared of maybe, scared that maybe the things that, that they have grown accustomed to might have to change, okay? Um, but, and I believe that all those fears are operative, you know? Fear that all the stories that have been told to me that helped me to develop some sense of my identity, those might be wrong, right? Or, you know, that even though we were not better than almost everybody, we were better at least than them, and so, you know, and I can't give that up, you know, right? Or some, something like those kinds of fears, and I think those are real. Um, and, and those are, and we can think about how that might work both on an interracial and an intraracial level, right? But then there's also just terror, as in the people who run this will kill you if you don't exceed to the already existing order of things. And so I think it's a combination of fear and terror. And the terror is induced by terrorism, right? Um, and, and there's a long, I remember I had this friend, um, you know, good friend in graduate school. I was hanging out with him and he had this friend from England and he came to visit. And he was like, I was like, well, what are you working on? He's like, well, I'm interested in, you know, why it is that a labor party never formed in the United States. You know, and he had this like whole elaborate kind of under, you know, quest, you know, theory of it that it all seemed smart, you know, but it was real complicated or, you know, pretty complicated. And I remember one time, and I started reading some stuff and I read one thing was like, well, because the, the violent suppression of labor by capital, they kill people, <laughs> right? They shot folks. Okay, so you understand? Th that's terror. That's not just fear, okay? So, so it's a war is what I'm saying. You know, it's, I got this really good friend who's like a brilliant, you know, thinker and, and activist named Manolo Callahan. And he's got me and some other friends really reading Ivan Illich. And it's, Illich talks about, what is it, the war against subsistence. Okay. It's like that there's been a historic war against subsistence and it, and, and, and what Manolo also does, he, he invokes Du Bois, he talks about the, 
democratic despotism it was a term Du Bois used, where, where the sort of forms of democracy and the rhetoric of democracy is actually used to produce terror and despotism in certain places, especially in, 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 in the third world. And, and certainly here, we know that. We know that the regime of, of, of Jim Crow was, is a form of democratic despotism. And, and the forces who engaged in that are still alive and they're still trying to organize it, right? So it's still going on. And so there's this long history of, of democratic despotism, this long history of the war against subsistence, and it's a, long, and it's a history of conquest. It's the history of the conquest of this continent, right? And, and the history of the conquest of this continent is an extension of the history of conquest in Europe, right? The history of the suppression of those moments of social insurgency that, that Shakespeare is writing about, right? Well, if we think, what is subsistence? Well, you say, well, subsistence is the, is the capacity to, you know, to, to live, to, to, to produce and to, to organize a livable life for oneself, to, to be sufficient for oneself in a certain way. I said, but no, that, that's not what subsistence is. Because you can't, because there's no such thing as self-sufficiency. We, we need other people, <laughs> you know? Richard II in Shakespeare talks about this. I, I thought I was a king. I thought I had absolute power. It turns out I need food. I need friends. That's his great, re re there's this great British actor named, uh, uh, oh, man, what's the dude's name? Man. He played in Wolf Hall and, oh man, I can't think of his name. But if you get on YouTube, just look up Richard II's speech at Pomfret Castle. It's, it's beautiful and pitiful. He's a, the king is on the ground crying. I need friends. I need, you know, I'm vulnerable. I can't do it by myself. My sovereign power is a, is a, is a lie, right? So, so, so subsistence isn't about self-sufficiency. It's about this capacity that we all share to live beyond our means as a function of sharing. Right? You know, I don't, I don't just, you know, I'm not self-sufficient. I, I, you know, and what people, bosses, the owners, they want to monopolize the capacity to live beyond your means. Right? You know, they know they need a nanny, maybe two, for their little kids, but they don't want you to have, not a nanny, they don't even want you to have a, Grandma, aunts, and all they, 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 they say, well, yeah, it takes a village for me to raise my kids. You do it by yourself, right? You know, right? They, 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 they want to they wanna, they wanna hold the, 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 they know that to subsist, to survive, they are not sufficient to themselves. And they want access to other people who will give them what they need so that they can have their life. But they, don't want, but they don't want to share that, okay? So what I'm saying is, it's a war against subsistence, which is a war against sharing, okay? And, and the people who are prosecuting this war, they use all means at their disposal to prosecute this war, okay? Um, and some of the means are ideo ideological, and that produces fear. And some of the means are just straight up brutality, right? And, that's, and that produces terror. Okay. Um, and I feel like the first thing we gotta do, okay, is kind of come to grips with the fact that it's a war. And we might have all kinds of commitments to I don't want to kill anybody. I don't, I'm not sure that I'll get through life without having done so, <laughs> but I don't want to, okay? You know, but, but, but I do want to kill this, this system. 
I wanted to, to, to be dead. Um, and that means I can't call myself a nonviolent person. Okay. My commitment not to killing does not equal a commitment to nonviolence. It's a commitment to the most fundamental radical disruption, not just of like, not taking other people's, not just that, but really at the level of this fundamental question about what is the nature of sociality, right? So, so it's, it's, it would be, and, and I feel like what black study is, is this lovingly violent commitment to the thoughtful disruption of the ridiculous ideas upon which this already existing structure of the world is predicated. That's what black study is. And black studies in the university needs to always maintain its relationship to that fundamental mission of black study. And if being in the university means you have to give up that disruptive mission, then it's better to not be in the university. Okay. Um, if you can't figure out a way to maintain that, you know, so, um, because it's a war, right? And, and, and it feels like they're trying to kill everything. You know, like they're trying to eat everything, own everything, destroy everything. Um, so, you know, we have to fight that um, and we have to recognize that. So. Huh? Hey, Dr. Hey. Um, are there things that the system, the sports can't reach? Like you talk about social insurgency, revolt being in the air, is there a way to kind of protect the from the incorporation of, of that revolt? Um, so I, I guess that was two questions, I'm sorry. But the first <laughs> is, is, is there something that that the owner can't get at, so to speak. Um, there's a script in the Bible, I think, about those who ruin the earth will be ruined. Um, and, and I heard you kind of speak about, you know, the ruin of the earth because of all that consumption. But what I wonder is if there's something that can't be ruined. Well, It feels like the human beings who run things on the earth are committed to a, to a set of practices that seem likely to end in, in well, maybe not likely, um, but could potentially end in destruction of the Earth's capacity to sustain human life, right? Um, it's what Adorno and Horkheimer call it, instrumental rationality run amok, right? You, 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 you make a set of decisions in the interest of accumulation that eventually will lead to the absolute eradication of the ability to accumulate, <laughs> right? Um, uh, the reason I say it like that is because my, again, my mind is telling me to say, no, there's, there's, the, the, but they can't get everything. They can't get everything. But actually, I, I kind of feel like on a strategic level, we should probably assume that they could get everything. Just because because this man is dangerous, you know, and we ought not underestimate. So we ought to assume that they can get everything, or a better way to put it would be 
that from our perspective, they can get everything. But there's another perspective from which it does seem to me that they can't. So when I was playing yesterday, that song for y'all, Relaxing by a Creek, where the woman was singing a song to a creek, about the creek, with being accompanied by the creek, you know, in, in New Guinea. The music will persist even if she's not there to sing. Okay. So I don't think that this man can kill the earth. Okay. But, but there's this, and you know, I mean, man, I hate to, <laughs> this almost seems like this kind of thing that, well, I mean, I guess I got to keep saying, <laughs> saying it, you know, but I mean, You know, I, it, it, it probably won't get to that point. So what we have to do is, we, we, you know, these are, like you were saying, sir, these are cosmological questions. These are physics questions now, right? Um, and we're, we're really interesting and beautiful human beings. We can do like that beautiful thing with language, and we can do all kind of other stuff too. And we make a lot of beautiful stuff, you know, but we're not nearly as interesting and beautiful enough to justify our destructiveness. There's a whole lot of other interesting, beautiful stuff too. And, you know, matter and energy are conserved. Newton teaches us that. So, it's going to always be something here. But what we ought to see, it feels to me like what we need to do is to see if we could earn the right to be here for a little while longer. And the way we could do that would be by not stomping all over what it is that, that ultimately we are. Just step more lightly. Right? So... So yeah, something will persist, and something of us will be in what persists. But, but we have a chance to, to make that more interesting and more beautiful. Um, but we have to overcome some of what it is that makes us truly, truly dangerous. Okay. Um, and, you know, I'd like to think that we can, you know. Um, my, I had another great old teacher, another condition of possibility, Masao Miyoshi, um, who's my teacher my first year in graduate school. And by the end of his life, he had become, well, he was always a curmudgeonly kind of dude. <laughs> like he would, I remember in class, he used to say, always complain. You know, for him, that was like an ethical imperative, you know, never, be, you know, but, but he started writing this really beautiful stuff on ecology. And, and at the end of his life, he was saying, well, you know, now that I'm 80 years old, he says, what gives me comfort is the idea that the earth will outlast us, <laughs> you know, and, um, I, I would like to, you know, I, I, I'd like for us to hang around as long as we could. But you have to, you have to earn that. You know, the earth is only going to take so much. So, and we are earth. It's Curtis Mayfield said, we're too from the good black dirt, right? So, so we have to, you know, the, the, the biggest insult Prospero hurls at Caliban is when he says, thou earth. Well, he's like, okay, well, in your mind, that's an insult. I'm going to claim, I, you know, me, I am whatever you say I am, to quote Rakim, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? Um, so we could claim what it is that's fundamental in us as earth and develop an ethical comportment towards Earth 
that is predicated on the idea of like preservation and gentleness rather than ownership, you know, then, then you know, we, we have a chance. And everything that falls under the rubric of, of anti-blackness, of misogyny, of the, the brutalization of indigenous people, it all goes back to that, you know? It is both, it's, it is, it's essential to that, and at the same time, it's, it's an effect of that. So, <coughs> so these are all, this is what we have to study. This is what we have to practice. Um, and obviously, you know, it's hard. <laughs> but, but it's not like we don't know. Okay, so. Oh, go ahead. So, um, so I have a question kind of relating back to um, kind of the concept of the war against sustenance and the war against charity. Um, so one thing that uh, you said was, I am not self-sufficient. Uh, and so it made me think of something I had heard someone else say, and they were saying that um, I am not easy to love, and then that is a good thing. That is okay. That is okay that my community has to work to love me. Um, and so I kind of wanted to just know what your thoughts on that position are. Do you think those two make sense together? So the I am not easy to love on the one hand, and what was the, the first? The I am not self-sufficient. I need other people. Oh. Huh. It's funny how the, the brain works, because <laughs> now it's like, how can I, how can I address the question? Because my head is just filled with like Billie Holiday singing "Easy to Love." <laughs> so I'm like, what is, what does this mean? Keep going, yeah. Help me. I might have forgotten what I was going to say. But if we're thinking about the fact that you need community to survive, right? If that is, you know, like an aspect that is just necessary as a whole, then isn't it in our benefit to be easy to love, right? Doesn't that help us out? Because then we have a community who can love us. But right, that also doesn't make sense because it, but then your community isn't really loving you, right? Because you're changing yourself so that your community will love you. So that was kind of, it feels counterintuitive, I guess. It's, why I wanted to ask this question. Um, well, I, no, I, I, well, I would say I do, I absolutely believe in the necessity and also the general possibility of being easy to love, <laughs> you know? Um, I was in the airport in, in, in D.C. yesterday on my way here. And it was, you know, it's just a typical airport thing, and you see you know, this young couple there, and they had two little kids, and the little boy was just running through the airport, and this lady was sitting on the other side of the room at another table, and she was just smiling. And I was like, okay, well, that, for her, that little boy was easy to love, <laughs> you know? Um, What? See, this produces tremendous ethical dilemmas. Because what we, seems like what we would want to do is we would want to try to make an argument for, for the general recognition of what's easy to love, right? Like you, you, you want to figure out, is there a way for me to look at people that enhances, it doesn't make them easier to love, <coughs> but that enhances my capacity to recognize that they are easy to love. How can I, perf can I, is that a skill I can acquire? Can I learn to look at people different so that they're becoming, but then, but then it produces a dilemma. Well, shit. What, are you saying you want to learn how to look at Putin, you know, or at, <laughs> you know, whoever, you know. <laughs> it, it's complicated. 
you know? But I do think I don't know, it's, that's a tough, I, I feel like, see my, my trouble is, like y'all talking about, oh, it's so, he's Fred Money's so, so generous. That's another, that's a really nice way of saying he talks too much, you know? And, and, and then I'm like, what? And I can't stop myself, you know? It's like, I, I know, but I'm like, but this, I'm, I ain't gonna be able to sleep tonight because, because, Do I want everybody to be easy to love? How much bad stuff do you have to do before we want to revoke, you know, your capacity to be easy to love? <laughs> right? Like these are these real, <laughs> what makes it, what is it, what makes people do the kinds of things that they do that makes them no longer easy to love? Usually the answer is pretty simple, lack of love, <laughs> right? So, so what, look, this is why, you know, the, 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 the major religions in the world, across the board, are deeply committed to a set of formulations about the nature and capacity and the work of forgiveness. Right? That's why. That's why people work on that. Because it's basically like, it, within the tradition that I was raised in, we are sinners. You have to be forgiven, you know? And what is it that has to be forgiven? You know, great French philosopher Jacques Derrida, forgiveness ain't really forgiveness unless it is forgiveness of the unforgivable. Easy forgiveness ain't nothing. You have to be able to forgive the unforgivable. I mean, we're in South Carolina, and I, when I think of South Carolina, I think of, you know, Mother Bethel, right? And I remember some of my colleagues in black studies, you know, were mad at the families of those people who were killed because they forgave. I was like, as if they suffered from some sort of ignorance or false consciousness. I was like, or that they were pressured politically. I'm like, well, no, well, you know, what if it's just that they had a deep, 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 deep understanding of the necessity of this practice of forgiveness? And what if at a certain point, their forgiveness actually is, needs to be understood by some of us as that which we must forgive, right? It's deep now, see? It's just deep. I don't know, I don't know. I do know that it just feels better to imagine being easy to love. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think that that feels like something we should all attempt to, to cultivate. And it feels like we should all not only try to be easy to love, but try to give other people as much help as we could possibly give them so that they can be easy to love too. So. Yeah.